of a friend who was um, transformed um, through an unwanted uh, challenge, an unwanted heartache, the um, uh, accident involving her son that put him at um, uh, his life at risk and a long journey back to recovery. Um, writes that this friend recognized that although her identity at the beginning of that story, of that experience, was as a worrier, she worried and worried and worried and worried and worried, um, God used that experience to change her identity and give her a new name so that by the end she had been transformed from a worrier into a warrior, a prayer warrior. This woman was um, part of a church fellowship, part of a um, small group, and um, that group, um, in, instead of, or in addition to meeting um, regularly, um, had a number of members who were friends who committed to meeting on a weekly basis to hear the woman's pain, to hear the journey, to get updates on her son's um, journey, and most critically and importantly, to pray together. And out of that experience of intimate connection, deep fellowship, listening, and the practice of prayer, she testifies she emerged transformed, emerged victoriously from a warrior into a warrior. That's what we hope for in our um, walk of faith together, and that's the kind of um, principles that we're outlining in this Emerging Victoriously series. We began with a number of messages um, outlining um, from moving from brokenness to belief, belief in God, a yielding to Christ as Savior, an inviting of the Holy Spirit into life to transform and convict and give us courage and strength, and then a belief in the um, grace of God so that even when we're not perfect, we can claim grace and continue to be used of God in mighty ways. We moved then into a series of messages, um, which today's message wraps up this part of moving from isolation to belonging. Um, next week, um, I'll be uh, away, and uh, Merv Stolzfus, our conference minister um, and head of our oversight team, will be present, and he'll bring a message, um, and also uh, he'll lead out in um, the recognition of David Heinemann's um, ordination. David has been ordained for um, decades, I don't know how long, but a long time already, um, a graduate of um, um, Dallas Seminary and um, uh, served in pastoral assignments and now most recently has been being used of God um, in hospice um, chaplaincy work for which he continues to need his ordination credentials. Uh, David and um, Tro um, felt called of God to um, connect with our congregation uh, a year or two ago. We're uh, deeply grateful for their, um, their presence with us, their commitment to us. Um, I'm deeply um, uh, humbled um, with the integrity that I see in their lives. I'm grieved that I can't be here next week. Um, but Merv, as conference rep, um, is the one who kind of will recognize the ordination now with ACC, and uh, so he's preaching um, during the time that I'm gone. So I just wanted, since I won't be here next week, I wanted to give a public testimony, uh, David, to um, the integrity that I see you um, living out of and the effectiveness of your ministry. I'm just so grateful that we here at Conestoga can, um, could uh, recommend uh, to ACC the receiving of your um, of your credentials. So then um, that'll be the, the wrap up of um, um, isolation to belonging. And uh, in June, July, we'll look at ineffectiveness to mature impact. And later in the summer from irrelevance to partnership with, uh, with, with Christ. Now, we're going to see if I can um, switch this. Hmm. I guess, Ryan, you're going to have to stay awake in the sermon after all. <laughs> Try it again. All right. One of these days, uh, we're, going to, um, uh, we're going to have the capacity 
to, um, for the preacher to um, move the outline along, uh, but all good things take time. Um, I just want to say I'm really grateful for our young adults for um, working at this project and achieving the excellence that they're achieving. Um, I don't know if you notice, probably not, because only teachers have eyes in the back of their heads, but if you look around, um, they were in here and achieved um, what's called a comfort screen, um, a projection on the back wall, so that as the preacher and the worship leaders, when we're here on the platform, we don't need to be turning around like this in order to see what's uh, being projected. So that's a, um, that's a, a, a new uh, next step, and really uh, the only thing uh, we have yet to achieve is the, um, the um, wiring that would uh, allow the movement of the um, slides from up here and um, the um, screens uh, on these uh, two walls yet. And then I think the um, project is uh, completed with excellence and under budget, which I think both of those are to be celebrated. I think we ought to applaud our... Uh, <laughs> So, today we're um, looking at um, how we, as a people of God, achieve um, meaningful membership. Um, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 um, says, For we were all baptized by one Spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. I love, the, that, I love that imagery. Whether Jews or Greeks, that points out that one body is achieved by the work of the Spirit. One body is achieved even though people come from different um, uh, cultural backgrounds, different um, traditions, different um, um, even religious uh, heritage, whether Jews or Greeks, one body, whether slave or free. In other words, there can be wealthy people in the church, there can be people on welfare, the full range of economic realities, and the Spirit draws us into one body. Why? Because we're all given the one Spirit. And then um, Paul adds that imagery, the one spirit to drink. So um, I'm going to invite you to uh, recite this uh, verse um, with me. But before we do that, I want you just to recall a time where you were um, physically in significant need of a drink. You were dehydrated. And someone brought you water or lemonade. The image for me is when I was in the Negev desert and literally was dehydrated such that I would have been hospitalized if I hadn't got rehydrated. That's how bad I was. Or um, growing up on the farm, um, hot summer days, bailing hay or straw and being high up in the barn uh, stacking the bales and knowing I was really, really thirsty and then mom would come out with a glass of lemonade. So in each of those settings, I can just picture, my memory's not good enough to know, but I can picture that when I took to drink, my response was, ah. So can you remember such a time? You were desperate. And it was like, ah. Now recall a time where you were spiritually desperate. You knew you were dry. You knew you were needy of God touching. Well, Paul's assuring us, we have within us, that work of the Holy Spirit, that we can go, oh, in those desperate times. God is with us. God is in me. God is guiding me. God is protecting me. 
God will give me wisdom even in the face of the hard time. I'm not alone. I'm not powerless. <sighs> the drink of the Holy Spirit. So let's um, say this scripture together. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Together? For we were all baptized by one Spirit into one body whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. The um, bulletin outline is, uh, or the sermon outline is in the bulletin. If you uh, wish to follow along, and if it helps you um, stay engaged to uh, fill in the um, outline, um, there it is uh, for you. So uh, we're recognizing that uh, there's different um, uh, behaviors or practices of belonging to the body that deepens meaningful membership. And one of those is the practice of baptism. Now baptism is not the way we become a member, but baptism confirms belonging. In other words, it's... Um, or pardon me, I meant to say baptism is not the way that we, um, we are saved. That's what I meant to say. We do have baptism be the entrance into membership. Baptism is not the way we are saved. It's faith in Jesus Christ. It's believing. It's yielding to um, what the scripture says about who Jesus is that releases salvation. But then baptism is the confirmation of what God has done in us. And through that confirmation, baptism says, this is gonna be the specific group of people that um, will walk with me and that I will give my gifts to. So baptism doesn't make you a Christian, it shows that you are, are already one, and it, it, um, it drives a stake. It publicly acknowledges your salvation. It publicly acknowledges your salvation before the Father, which um, Jesus says in Matthew 10, everyone who acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before the Father. So baptism functions in a confirmation that way before others and before God the Father because you're testifying before others. It's an acknowledgement to the church. It's asking for the church family's help, and it's committing to be of help to this specific group of people. And then finally, it's an acknowledgement to the world. It drives a stake in the ground, serves as a testimony, an acknowledgement to unsaved friends and to others that your intent and your commitment and your goal is to walk in the ways of God. So who should be baptized? Well, Luke 3.21 says... When all the people were baptized, Jesus was baptized too. So who should be baptized? Every follower of Jesus. We don't find in the um, scriptures any exceptions. We want every, every follower to um, be in obedience to this um, instruction of, um, of Jesus. When should we be baptized? Well, we believe it should come soon after believing. Acts 2.41 says those who accepted his message, and uh, in this context it was Peter who was preaching, those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Now, some churches um, practice uh, infant baptism. When a child is born, uh, soon after, the parents bring the child um, in for um, um, a baptism, which is a way of um, um, declaring that the original sin has been overcome. It's a ceremony where the parents promise to raise their children in the faith, 
And it's a way for the church to uh, welcome that child into the community of faith. And then they pray that when the children um, grow up, they will la later confirm their own faith um, when they reach the age of accountability. Um, we don't um, denigrate churches that uh, practice infant baptism, but uh, we don't practice it in our faith tradition because we don't find in the um, scriptures evidence of an infant baptism. What we find is what we like to call believer's baptism. The baptism follows a person deciding themselves to follow Jesus. And how can an infant um, know their own sin and make that uh, conscious decision? So instead of practicing infant baptism, um, our congregation practices what's called parent-child dedication. The um, parents bring the child um, into our morning worship, and um, we have a prayer of um, commissioning and dedicating that child. We, um, we claim the promise of God that that child is safe in the, in the grace of God. We recognize the time will come where the child will have enough consciousness, that age of accountability, to make their own decisions. And so the, the parents dedicate the child. The church um, dedicates to help raise that child in the faith. And we pray then when the child reaches that age of accountability, they will indeed embrace Jesus um, as personal Savior and then uh, yield to um, baptism, to a believer's baptism based on their confession of faith. So when should you be baptized? Well, I would say as soon as receiving Christ into your life is a, is a settled issue, you're invited to prepare for baptism. And um, if the congregation affirms the use of this material that I'm introducing in this series of messages in the future, this would be the material that you would go through, um, a person would go through, having made a commitment to Christ. Currently, we um, use uh, other material for a preparatory class, and we encourage people to... Um, um, to communicate. Um, last week when evangelist Steve Wingfield was here, um, there were a number of persons. Now, I, I too had my, my head bowed and my eyes closed to not violate confidentiality, but there was a number of persons who indicated they had made a commitment to Christ. Praise God. Praise God. There's nothing more um, significant. Nothing of greater celebration um, but the next step is an invitation to share it with somebody and share it with a member of the pastoral team, share it with me, share it with someone so we can speak with you about um, preparation um, for, for baptism. So who should be baptized? Every follower when? Um, soon. And then um, covering how do we baptize here at uh, CMC? Well, we use either of the New Testament methods, pouring or immersion. Um, when the new facility was built, there's um, um, a, a, a pole here that can be filled up with water. So we can um, baptize by immersion here. Uh, we've also gone out to um, a pond. We've gone to a swimming pool. Um, we'll go, I mean, we like to have it here because a larger percentage of people can participate, but we'll respect you if, um, if there's some other place that has greater meaning, greater significance that you want to be um, immersed. Um, we also um, will practice uh, baptism by, uh, by pouring because um, that too is uh, illustrated uh, in the New Testament. So what happens is um, I um, share a few words about the importance, the significance of, um, of the meaning of baptism. Um, you'll be introduced. Um, we'll uh, communicate to the congregation that the pastoral team has recommended you, has, has, has validated your, um, your readiness. Um, I'll ask several, several questions. Um, questions like, have you accepted Jesus? Because the scriptures encourage people to be ready to give a, a, a testimony. A, and so it's, it's just good for you to affirm it. And it's good for the congregation to hear your response of, yes, I, I have. And um, I might ask the question of, are you ready to consecrate yourself to service? Will you give and receive, question, uh, give and receive counsel? And do you desire to be baptized? Assuming the answer 
answers are yes, then uh, we invite the congregation to um, stand. That's the way the congregation shows they're going to stand with you. They're committed to you, committed to prayer for you, committed to the Lord's purposes in your life. And then you'll be invited to kneel if you chose pouring or to enter into the water if you um, chose immersion and uh, be baptized. And then um, uh, we extend the right hand of fellowship and invite you into uh, the fellowship of God's people into a journey towards meaningful membership in the body of Christ. So that's uh, baptism, confirming belonging. Communion, then, is one of the ways that we, we deepen our belonging. Uh, we deepen our belonging to the people of God, and we deepen our belonging um, to Christ and to God. Now, communion um, should essentially be um, a testimony of peace. It should testify that we're at peace with God and with one another. Matthew 5, 23 to 24 says, first go, this is actually in the context of an offering, um, but it illustrates the, the, the importance that God places in being in right relationship, being at peace with one another. It says, if you bring your offering and you remember that someone has something against you, set your gift aside and go and be reconciled to that individual. Work it out. Come to peace. And then when you've worked it out, then come back, get your gift and offer it as an offering. All through the New Testament, we're um, um, commissioned and advised and called upon to do our part to, um, to uh, be at peace uh, with one another. I um, saw um, this week um, on social media um, a, um, a woman psychiatrist um, who had been asked to give a speech to fellow um, mental health workers on the um, impact of stress. And she stood in front of the um, hundreds of uh, persons um, holding a glass like this. She said, now, um, some of you may be thinking that the reason I'm holding a glass, it's an illustration of the age-old question, is it half empty or half full? Are you, are you, are you optimists or are you uh, pessimists? And, but she said, no, that's, that's not why I'm holding the glass. She said, some of you may think that I have um, a dryness of uh, throat, and so when you saw the glass, you just assumed she has it up there so that if she needs to take a, a sip of water, um, she has it handy. But she said, that's, that's not the uh, issue. She said, I wonder um, how long um, I would hold this glass, um, just kind of ignoring it, before you would start to wonder, you know, won't it get uncomfortable? You know, you hold a glass out like that, it's pretty insignificant in its weight. It doesn't have much impact. But let five minutes go by and, you know, already I, I, I can feel, I guess I'm showing my age, just five minutes holding that out, just that little glass out there, and I can, I can start to feel the muscle right here starting to tight, tighten up. So she said, to imagine if uh, someone um, was practicing a form of torture, and, um, um, you know, they, they, they're, they're going to they're gonna beat you up badly if you don't any longer hold that glass just like that. Could an hour go by? Could several hours? After a while, it becomes an unbearable burden. Well, she said, that's the way stress is. That's the way unforgiveness is. Initially, it's kind of inconsequential. In fact, she said, you know, sometimes it's even good to kind of hold stress or, you know, something that you've been wrong to just kind of hold it out there and look at it. You kind of have to take a look at it in order to get to a better place. But if you hold on to it, if you just keep holding on to the stress, if you keep holding on to the way you've been wronged, you're torturing yourself. You're eventually going to be beating up on yourself. 
It just becomes this small, inconsequential, or it may have been huge and not inconsequential. But either way, if you aren't willing to turn it over to God, now, I didn't listen long enough to her, her speech to know if this was kind of where she went with it. I don't even know if she was a believer. I, I, I didn't listen that long. So now the, now the preacher will take over. You know, if you, don't, if you don't release the stress and you don't release the wrongdoing, if you don't give it over to God, if you insist on holding on to it, you've set yourself up to be beat up badly. So, you know, communion is a time where the scriptures tell us, you know, it ought to be a testimony of peace. And so, before we practice communion, um, we ask the congregation to take advantage of the opportunity of examining ourselves, as the scriptures tell us we should, and, you know, make things right. Let it go. And come to the table where you've done your part to be at peace. We can't, we can't manipulate whether another person um, responds. We can't control um, at all. the mess of the world. We can't control the mess of relationships. All we can know is that we've done our part. And so communion is that ongoing invitation to um, reflect. Have I let stuff go? I'm told that uh, eating together in the biblical culture um, was a a sign that you were at peace. In other words, you weren't to sit down at table or to sit down to eat with other people unless you were at peace with them. And it makes sense because is there any environment where tension um, is felt more quickly than when you're at table with someone? I mean, can you think of another context? When you sit down to eat with family or friends, if there's unsolved tensions, you just feel it. You can't disguise it. There's something about the sharing of food that is meant to be rich and peaceful. You can't hide the tensions. So... Communion deepens belonging because it gives us opportunity to declare we've been forgiven and to extend forgiveness. Declare it before God. Declare it before others. And we here at Conestoga, we, we uh, have multiple places where we share food and fellowship. It's not just in communion. It's a... It's a um, First Sunday uh, Connect before Sunday school. It's, it's a fourth Sunday fellowship meal. It's uh, lots of opportunities. Most of the small groups have, um, have uh, food together and um, interaction. It's a beautiful recognition of that strength of fellowship. Um, I even heard uh, one of the members of the ball team. Uh, they've been doing quite well, but they kind of got beat up. Well, they didn't get beat up this week. They were ahead for a while, but they got beat. And uh, anyway, um, somebody always has refreshments. It's usually Becky. Um, she's amazingly generous. And the uh, member of the ball team said, well, we may not always, we may not have the most winning record. We may not be the team that wins the most often, but we are the only team that always has refreshments. And he was saying that to me as the other team was, you know, walking, walking off the field, walking away, going home. Our ball team, they often hang around for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour. It's beautiful. It's fellowship. It's a way to be meaningful in our membership together. Communion we're recognizing it should testify of peace. It's also a simple act, but it's a simple act of profound reality. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 25 is one of the scriptures we often use where Paul's, you know, quoting Jesus. 
in saying, when Jesus took the bread, he said, you know, this, this bread, a simple act of breaking a simple thing, a loaf of bread, it's my body. And this cup, it's the new covenant. Simple, ordinary things that take on a profound reality. Now, we recognize that Scripture promises Jesus is in our midst at all times. He's present with his people, in his people. So we don't believe the bread and the cup, um, you know, introduces Jesus into the context. Jesus is already in our midst, but the bread and the cup become a, um, a symbol, um, an evidence, a, a confirmation of Jesus already being there. So we don't talk about it as a sacrament. We talk about it as um, a sign, a sign of the reality of Christ's presence with us. How often do we practice communion in our church? Well, we're not legalistic about it, but our pattern has tended to be the last number of years, about four times a year. We've been practicing communion at um, the first Sunday, um, our covenant renewal um, service, um, at our Maundy Thursday service, which is the Thursday before Easter, so it moves around on the calendar, but it always comes the Thursday before Easter. Um, we practice communion on Pentecost Sunday, which again moves around according to Easter on the schedule, but it's generally um, sometime in May. And then the fourth um, Sunday is always the first Sunday of October because that's what's been designated by um, people uh, across the world, uh, multiple religious traditions, as World Communion Sunday. And so it's extra special to uh, celebrate communion that first Sunday of October because we recognize believers all around the world on this morning are um, celebrating, um, celebrating communion together. Finally, we um, recognize that communion participation does have expectations. Um, 1 Corinthians 11, um, that uh, invitation to examine yourself before eating. Um, I don't want that to create uh, fear, even though it does go on to say, you know, some people have gotten sick because they aren't examining themselves. Um, I don't want people to, um, you know, to be afraid of communion like somehow it's going to lift God's grace. I think what Paul's talking about there is if God has been convicting you about a sin, if God has been, um, you know, speaking to you, or before you come to the table, examine yourself and give God invitation to speak, and then that God points something out, don't ignore it. The reason for examination, the re reason for inviting the Holy Spirit, the reason the Holy Spirit is in our lives is for the purpose of us then acting to clean it up. So I believe we only make ourselves vulnerable when we fail to, on an ongoing basis, ask the Holy Spirit to point out the areas of life that need to be cleaned up. So examine ourselves and then follow through and um, let God um, cleanse and purify. I've run out of time, so let me simply note um, in closing, meaningful membership, our meaningful investment is the fruit of belonging. We can anticipate opportunity to give generously. It's great fun to do it together. We can embrace partnering graciously. We don't all have to get our way. We're generous at auctions and generous in offerings towards a budget, and really great stuff happens such that we can celebrate a multiplied impact. We can celebrate contributing to so much more than any of us could do alone. Meaningful membership in the body of Christ. Amen. Celebration hymnal, please. Number 425.
Number 425.